The Mortal God Leviathan, 1651 by Thomas Hobbes. Nature has made men so equal in the faculties of the body and mind as that though there be found one man sometimes manifestly stronger in body or of quicker mind than another, yet when all is reckoned together, the differences between man and man is not so considerable. So essentially what he's saying here is that men are pretty equal. For as to the strength of body, the weakest has the strength to kill the strongest, either by secret machination, that means a secret plan, you know, or something like that, or by confederacy with others, by getting together with a bunch of other people to kill this guy, that are in the same danger with himself. So he's in the same danger of being killed by everybody else, um, like he can kill everybody else. And as to the faculties of the mind, I find yet a greater equality among men than that of strength. So everybody's mind is even more equal than everybody's body. Such is the nature of men, that howsoever they may acknowledge many others to be more witty, or more eloquent, or more learned, yet they will hardly believe there are many so wise as themselves, for they see their own wit at hand, and other men's at a distance. So he says, essentially, all men are, are pretty much equal in how well they can think. But no man will admit that another man out there is just as wise as he is. Even though he'll say, oh, he's stronger than me, he's funnier than me, he's maybe quicker than me. But no, he's definitely not wiser than me. That's what Thomas Hobbes is saying that people are like. <clears throat> From this equality of ability arises a quality of hope in attaining our ends, as in our goals. So we're all equal and we all have an equal hope of attaining what we want. And therefore, if any two men desire the same thing, which nevertheless they cannot both enjoy, they become enemies. And in the, in the way to their end, which is principally their own conservation, endeavor to destroy or subdue one another. So essentially, everybody's equal. Everybody wants similar things and people think that they have the same right to get the things that they want. So what ends up happening is, is if two people want something and there's only one of them so they can't both have it, then they will kill each other to get it. So equality causes killing. Okay. And from hence it comes to pass that an invader has no more to fear than another man's single power. If one plant so build and possess a convenient seat, others may probably be expected to come prepared with forces united to dispossess and deprive him, not only of the fruit of his labor, but also of his life or liberty. And the invader again is in the like danger of another. So, so, what that's saying is, whatever we work for in life, we naturally have to worry about somebody else coming to take. And essentially, he's talking here about what we'll come to talk about as the state of nature. As that, if you go back to, say, the Stone Age, when there's no government, people are living in tribes and family groups, and yeah, there's no government, there's no law, there's no anything, right? In this state, every man has to worry about losing everything he has to any other man who wants it, but can't have it, or maybe doesn't want to work for it, or, or whatever. So anything that we work for is in constant danger of being taken away by the power of another person. And it all comes down to the fact that we're all so equal, we all want the same things, and we're willing to kill each other for them. Okay. And so, in, in, in terms of like a country, a country is also continuously in danger of somebody coming in and taking them over and taking all their stuff. And then that occupying country is immediately um, in danger of having their stuff taken from them um, by the people in that country or invaders from afar. Okay. Thus, men have no pleasure, but on the contrary, a great deal of grief in keeping company where there is no power able to overawe, overawe 
them all. So what that means is, unless there's some force out there that forces all people in a certain place to live peacefully and not kill each other, to take all their stuff because we're all equal, if there's not some force forcing us not to do that, then there is no pleasure for anybody because we all have to worry about our neighbors coming and killing us to take our stuff. So that, in the nature of man, we find three principal causes of quarrel. First, competition. Secondly, insecurity. Third, glory. So he's saying here there's three reasons that people fight each other and will kill each other. One is competition. One is because we're insecure. And one is because we want glory. The first makes men invade for gain, right? That's uh, competition. Uh, the second insecurity for safety, the third for reputation, that's glory. The first use violence to make themselves master of other men's persons, wives, children, and cattle. Okay, right, obviously we're talking about back in the day here. The second to defend them, the third for trifles as a word, a smile, a different opinion, or any other sign of undervalue, either direct in their persons or by reflection in their kindred, their friends, their nation, their profession, profession in their name. So if people kill each other for glory, then the type of rewards they're looking for are some things as simple as a word or a smile, um, a good opinion from somebody else, a trifle, something that's not really worth anything. Okay. Therefore, it is clear that during the time men live without a common power to keep them in awe, and in awe is like, you know, you're looking at God, like, oh my God, I'm in awe. You can't talk. Um, you just stand there and your eyes are really big and you're speechless and maybe some slack jawed, and, right? Okay. Therefore, that during the time that men live without a common power to keep them in awe, they are in that condition which is called war, and such a war is of every man against every man. Okay? So if you don't have some gigantic awe-inspiring power out there to keep you too afraid to kill your neighbor, then you're going to kill your neighbor and your whole country is going to be in a state of war. Every man against every man because they're not afraid of a big gigantic le leviathan sea monster, right? Keeping them in check. Okay. In such condition, there is no place for industry, there's no place for business. Because the fruit thereof is uncertain, nobody's going to work if they think that somebody can kill them and take all the stuff that they've worked for. And consequently, no culture of the earth, right, it means no farming, no navigation, you know, going around in boats, finding new places and trading. And consequently, oh, sorry, nor use of the commodities that may be imported by sea, right, nobody's going to be worried about salt and pepper if they're worried about getting killed by their neighbor. No commodious building, no instruments of moving and removing such things as require much force because all that force is going to be busy making war, so you're not going to be digging basements if you got to be, you know, building armies, killing other people. No knowledge of the face of the earth, you know, no exploring, no account of time, no arts, no letters, no society. There's nothing because everybody's worried about killing each other. And which is worst of all, continual fear, everybody's afraid, and danger of violent death, and the life of man, solitary, nasty, brutish, and short. And that's a famous quote by Hobbes, right? Brutish and short, that's life. Because we're all worried about killing each other unless we've got some gigantic power keeping us in awe. The final cause, end, or design of men who naturally love liberty, love freedom, and dominion over others is you know, and they love to control other people, is introduction of that restraint upon themselves by which we see them live in commonwealths. The only way to erect such a common power as may be able to defend them from the invasion of foreigners and the injuries of one another and thereby to secure them in such sort as that by their own industry and by the fruits of the earth they may nourish themselves and live contentedly is 
So in order to get all these good things, to be able to live in freedom and peace and work and be able to keep all the money that you make from work and to be free from all these fears, is to confer all their power. So all the people in the country have to give all their power in strength upon one man or an assembly of men, so one person or group, right? Remember that when we talk about the French Revolution. And may reduce all their wills, right? As in this one group is so powerfully, so powerful, it can reduce your will, it can take away, right, what you want by plurality of voices unto one will, right? So everybody gives up their... Um, all men shall submit their wills to his will, person, or, or concord, concord. It is a in one and the same person, made by covenant of every man with every man, in such manner as if every man should say to every man, I authorize and give up my right of governing myself to this man or to this assembly of men, on this condition that you give up your right to him and authorize all his actions in like manner. So essentially, everybody is willingly giving up their judgment, their will, all their freedom to this one person. And it's, it's equal and it's safe because everybody is giving up the same amount of freedom and in return they're getting the same amount of security, something that will protect each person from each other person. Okay. This done, that's made up of a group of people, each other, agreeing with each other to be governed by one person or body. This is the generation of that great Leviathan, and this is the government. The government is a big, scary sea monster, keeping everybody in awe, making everybody afraid, because if they weren't, they would go and kill each other, right? And life would be horrible and short. Rather, to speak more reverent, reverently of that mortal god, so the government is like a god, except it dies, it's mortal, to which we own under the immortal god our peace and defense. So this mortal god on earth, our government, our king, is like a god and will keep us peaceful, which we own. which we more reverently of that little god to which we own under the immortal god right M most likely some kind of christian god here but definitely a monotheist or deist our peace and defense so through this this king or this group that has ultimate control over all of us and holds us in awe through that body or person, we own our peace, you know, which keep, keeps us living in harmony and defense that defends us against each other and defends us against foreigners. For by this authority, given him by every particular man in the commonwealth, he hath the use of so much power and strength conferred on him, the power of everybody in the whole country, right, he has, that by terror thereof he is enabled to perform the wills of them all to peace at home and mutually, mutual aid against their enemies abroad. So this person or group has so much power because it has the power of the whole country who would rather have this way, have it this way. This person or group has so much power that it strikes terror in the hearts of everybody in the country and so they'll remain peaceful and they won't kill each other for stuff. Okay. And in him consists the essence of the commonwealth, which, to define it, is one person of whose acts a greater multitude by mutual covenants with one another have made themselves every one the author. To the end he may use the strength and means of them all as he shall think expedient 
for the peace and common defense. So this one person in the commonwealth, one person or group, speaks and acts for all, through the will of all who have willingly given up their freedom to this one person or group. And with all that power, that person acts in defense of the commonwealth and for the peace within the commonwealth. And this person is called sovereign and said to have sovereign power, you know, you know sovereign king, um, and said to have absolute power and everyone besides his subject. So everybody is subject to, has to perform the will of this one person or group. Got it? One person or group has unlimited power over everyone else, so much so that they're in awe of it, they're afraid of it, and it has to be that way because we are all equal, and because we're equal and we want the same things, we will kill each other to get them if we're not totally scared of some leviathan sea monster like government out there that has all of our wills together and so our defense and peace in its heart. Okay. Thomas Hobbes, Leviathan.